All right, so we're recording now. Uh, I am putting into the chat the SCA harassment and bullying policy. People should give that a read. I'll read it out as well. Uh, the SCA prohibits harassment and bullying of all individuals and groups. Participants engaged in this behavior are subject to appropriate sanctions. If you are subjected to harassment, bullying, or retaliation, or if you become aware of anyone being harassed or bullied, contact a seneschal, president of the SCA, or your kingdom boards a bunsen. Everyone be cool. All right, uh, so we're gonna start off this with just um, a quick warm up, just to kind of get us all up and moving stuff. We'll just do it really quick because we're gonna be doing a lot of shoulders and stuff today. Uh, so I don't want to wear our shoulders out, but just kind of getting them nice and loosened up would be kind of good. So just doing some shoulder rolls. Yeah, because I just woke up a couple of hours ago, so I'm still in the the morning wake up, body waking up phase of the day. And we'll reverse directions. Listen, watching from our car, dedication. <laughs> I, I, I tried to get home in time. <laughs> All right, now we'll do some. I kind of got lost in a park. No worries, we'll do some arm circles. Just go up whatever speed you're, feels good. The idea is really just try to get the shoulders warmed up and get an idea of how the joint's feeling. Uh, it's a big thing about warm is really just kind of get an idea of how your body's feeling at the moment. Uh, so, you know, if you're a little bit stiffer in a particular joint, especially if you have trouble joints, that some days are good, some days are bad, just to kind of give you an idea of how you're feeling for that one. And we'll reverse direction. Good, and now we'll do our self-hugs. A little bit of love this Saturday afternoon. I was about to say morning, afternoon. So again, the idea here is when I'm back here, I'm really thinking about trying to feel a stretch in my upper pecs. And then when I'm here at the hug, I'm thinking about rounding my upper back and shoulders to kind of really get those muscles a little bit, a little bit warmed up and lubricated. Cool, uh, now we're gonna do our reach backs. So it's good with, I'm gonna be having a nice stable stance. Uh, for me, it's about shoulder width apart. You might need a wider or narrower. Uh, keeping my hips and legs pointing forward, but I'm just gonna be twisting with my spine reaching back. Like there's a glass of water behind me that I'm too lazy to get up for, and it's going to twist back and grab. And then you want to go nice and easy. And then if you, your back's feeling pretty good, you can kind of go a little bit further and further. This is a good way of uh, loosening up that lower back, especially in the hips and stuff. Yes, now we're going to do. Uh, Hip circle. So pretend like we got big old hula hoops around our hips. We just kind of make as big of a motion as possible. You can go as fast or as slow as you want. I like to go nice and slow just in terms of uh, feeling the stretch, especially in the back of my hamstring. And reverse direction. Good. Now we do our ankle roll. So uh, you can either have your foot up in the air and just kind of draw circles with your ankle, or you can have it in the ground, kind of like you're digging circles in the dirt. This way it makes you work extra balance. And reverse direction. And other ankle. Weird hokey pokey. Here, reverse. Cool. Uh, now we'll just do some wrist rolls. So while he's already beating us to it, get those forearms, wrists, and hands feeling nice and loose. And reverse that direction. Cool, and now for these last 30 seconds, hit whatever body button you need. You know, need a little extra warm up time. I always do my side lunges, to try to get my hips and groins a little bit warmed up.
All right, uh, grab your swords and cloak or cloak-like objects and we can jump into this thing. So first we're gonna have just like how to wrap the cloak and there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing it. Um, assuming that you're wearing your cloak as you're a fast, fashionable fencer out there. Uh, let's fix the angle of my camera. Uh, how I usually do it is I kind of go to grab the, the hem of the collar, of the lead, like the front collar. So if this is over my left shoulder, uh, it would normally be, if you're a righty, it would be over your left shoulder. If you're a lefty, it would be over your right shoulder. Uh, that way just your sword arm is free for the drawing. Um, so from here, I'm going to just reach up, grab the hem of that collar, let the cloak start to fall behind my shoulder. And as it drops behind, I'm going to then try to wrap it around my arm. So back here, comes back, try to get around. Sometimes easier said than done. This takes a little bit of practice. But the idea is at the end, so if you don't want to do it that way, because uh, it might take a while if you try to do it super fancily, I'll just kind of drape it over my arm and then just give it a couple, a twirl or two. So depending on how much cloak you have, will depend how much, how many times you need to wrap it. Uh, this isn't a very long cape. This one just kind of goes down to my mid thigh. So I just kind of really just wrap it around one time. Uh, but I'm aiming for basically about two feet of fabric, pain and below. Uh, if I'm using a heavier wool cloak, I might need, that's like full length. Uh, I'm probably have to wrap that at least two times. Uh, but the idea is I want enough that it's dangling and protecting my low line, but not so low that if I basically relax my arm, I'm going to step on it. But if I stop moving around, I don't want to step on it and trip and stuff because that is super not fun for anybody. Uh, well, maybe for my opponent, but definitely not for me. Um, so another thing to kind of keep an eye, an eye, uh, a mind on this cloak is that when we use parrying the cloak, we don't want to be parrying with um, basically the, the, the flat of the cloak. Because uh, if I'm just trying to, if I just hold my cloak up like this, my opponent only needs to go through that much fabric. Not a lot. They're going to just be able to pin, blow right through it and pin me. Um, but if we think about this front hem of the cloak as being like the edge of our cloak, kind of like we want to always parry with the edge of our sword and daggers. So think about this is the edge of our cloak. Now, if they, they feel it's trying to get stuck in here, they're not just going through that small amount of fabric, but now they're trying to blow through all of this. And it's going to get stuck in there uh, and it's going to redirect it. Um, so like there's really, what makes the cloak very useful is um, the, it's the one, the length of uh, the cloak, just how much that it can um, cover your low line. It basically makes your low line targets not a thing your opponent can get to. Uh, this flexibility is very good because it hits and it really absorbs the energy well, and then I'll redirect it. Uh, but you also need that width. So this is the width of the fabric right here and not going through this direction. So if I just try to parry here, they're going to pin me. If I get it here, it's going to get stuck. Um, and it is a little bit unnerving the first time you try to parry with the cloak because you like it's going to yield a little bit because it's fabric. It's going to have a little bit of give, but it is going to redirect it afterwards and stuff. So like if you have a partner and stuff, you just might want to just to get used to how it feels. Just kind of like hold the cloak out there and just let your partner just throw shots into it so you have an idea of how, how it redirects and stuff. Uh, wool is definitely going to be much better or any kind of like heavier fabric. This is about as light as I would probably want to fence with. Like a heavier cotton canvas with a, a cotton lining. Um, so it's good for like long-term practice, um, but my wool cloak is going to be better in terms of actually eating swords and redirecting and stuff like that. Um, so that is how to basically hold this. And also just a, a note, um, I'm basically just have a little, little fist. So I, when I grab the edge of the hem, so here, and as I kind of wrap it around, I'm just kind of closing. So I have a little bit of a fist going inside the cloak. And there's always a debate about how much the cloak is good in terms of stopping shots that are going to the arm. Um, I really think it depends on one, how thick, like this is, this would not, if anyone did a cut on this thing, it's gonna be really bad for my arm. A wool cloak that's wrapped around a few times can probably stop some depending on how hard the hit 
the, the cuts are and stuff. Uh, but even with the cloak, you, you basically still don't want to try to take that blow. Like your arms underneath there, do you really want to like just trust the fabric to take any kind of cuts and shots and stuff? Which isn't a huge thing we need to worry about with SCA fencing, but something to kind of keep in mind, like a historical point of view and, and stuff like that. There we go. All right, so now we're gonna look at um, the different guards. And these are the guards that are specifically from Alfieri. Um, you might see different, uh, different guards in, from different masters, but it's a lot of them all kind of work on the same basic principle. Uh, and with cloak, uh, what we really do is we're really keeping our, for the most part, keeping our cloak extended. Because um, this is basically the cone of defense. If I just keep my cloak back here, it only covers a small amount of my body, but the further I extend it, you can just see how much more of my body gets hidden by that. Which is why, we, because this is why we want, uh, we have cloak, we're like buckler, or even sometimes a dagger, we can have more offhand extension, and then we can cap our sword a little more withdrawn. Uh, one, it hides how our range will be better from our opponent, and also we just have better defensive coverage. Uh, so we're gonna start off uh, with Prima, and then we'll just kind of work our way around the guards. So with Prima, so I'm gonna still have my basic on guard stance in terms of uh, uh, having my lead, my sword arm, sword, sorry, sword arm foot forward. I'm going to extend my cloak forward about as far as I can. This is gonna definitely square my hips up a little bit, which is fine. You might need to narrow your stance a little bit more. Uh, instead of having that usual wide stance, a little bit more of a narrow stance uh, might be a little more comfortable for this. And then I'm just gonna have my, Hold my sword in Prima with the tip of my sword and uh, my cloak joined together. So if I do kind of do this from this side, my tip is basically just resting on top of my hand, which is nice and comfortable there. My hilt is basically brought back uh, around basically where my head is. I do it from this side as well. That's our Prima. As you can see, like it covers my inside line is basically all uh, covered by this cloak. No one's going to really be able to hit my arm and stuff. And if I even turn more this way, it really hides where my body is, which is kind of nice. Uh, to get into Secundo, I'm just going to rotate my hand so it's palm down, lower my arm a little bit so my hilt is now at shoulder height. So Prima, the hilt was at head height. Secunda, uh, uh at shoulder height. Again, so resting the tip of my sword on top of the cloak. So I always want to keep my weapon and cloak join because that means now there's no opening between the weapons. Here, this kind of can get my opponent can slip through. Here, much harder for them to get through. Also, I'm doing this with a slight lean. So normally we have our lean, lean back. On all these, I'm more lean forward again because I just kind of maximize uh, my cone of defense with the cloak. From this other angle. Turf is also going to be arm extended uh, uh, with the, the slight lean. So again, cloak extended. Sword now, uh, so if I was to go I would rotate my sword hilt. So now it's down by my thigh. Again, so with this little bit of a forward lean. We see this with daggers too uh, in all the different masses. From this angle. From that angle. Uh, we do have one guard in which we can be more and further back. So if like after a while having that extended can be get kind of tiring on the arm. Uh, so what you can do is if I'm painting back here, now I can kind of come back into my regular on guard stance. And now my hand is basically close to the hill or I can have it back by my elbow, kind of like when we do the closed position in single right here. So at any time I get tired, I can just kind of come back here. Uh, Elfieri calls this his Gaudium Mista. Uh, it's really just a Terza variation. I'm going to call it Gaudium Mista. So when I say Mista, you know, we're in this, this lean back posture. If I say Terza, we're in this uh, uh, cloak extended posture. So basically the same guard, just he has two different names for him. And then we get into Quarta. Again, we're going back into our uh, cloak, his arm is extended. I'm going to turn my hand into Quarta, that's palm up. So I'm going to keep the point closer towards the ground. So this is more like this. 
this really just makes it hard for your opponent to be able to get reach and control your weapon. You could do, I have seen people do Porta kind of like the turrets up, but they just turn the hand up into Porta. So I think that's perfectly fine as well if you really want your swords and weapon joined. But Alfieri has cloak extended, point down. He doesn't say why. Uh, he doesn't really show any plays from this particular guard. Uh, but it's something I think would be kind of cool to experiment with. Any questions on the guards? No, not good. I like it. Cool. In terms of uh, aligning the tip with the front of the cloak, if you have a longer sword, you know, is it better to have the, the point stick out or get really twisted back so that you can get them lined up? Yeah, I would say, I'd say like, if it sticks out a little bit, I think that's fine. Because uh, if you have to twist so much that it's gonna really like screw up your body mechanics, then it's probably not worth it. If you find twisting yourself gives you some kind of advantage, it might be worth playing around with them. But yeah, if you have a really long sword, I think like even when I have it here, sometimes my tip is sticking out. Because this is my shorter blade. And yeah. I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Well, Good question. question. I'm using a, a relatively short blade and I'm still feeling a lot of twist on my back leg to reach the point to the cloak. Are you twisting your foot, or moving your back foot at all? Yeah, so when I, so if I, I'll try to get more of my feet into this in shot. Let me just be up to speak of you. So yeah, if this is my regular stance where my foot is still kind of like head back here, but if I'm going into my extended, I'm probably gonna turn a little bit. Like I don't wanna get into this runner pose, but turning from my back, because usually I have this really like uh, wide angle with my back foot. Sorry, you still can't see my foot. There we go. Usually I have this wide angle, but if I'm going into the uh, lean forward, I'll turn my, my uh, foot in a little bit. And part of that is because I have tight hips, um, but also just squaring up the hips, sometimes the body needs to kind of go with it. And that, that's perfectly fine. So is it okay if your body kind of just haunches into the uh, forward lean? Sorry, what was that? Uh, when I do it, it looks like my body kind of wants to tilt towards the, the, the direction I'm leaning into. Yeah, so like kind of think about like we're almost in like the offensive posture that we've got in class, um, but with the cloak extended and stuff. Yeah, like you know, I'm like, like this, but it feels like I should, you know, I don't know if that's a defect of how I'm doing it. You look like you're doing. You look like you're doing it right to me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely like with these with the cloak extended. There's definitely a, a slight lean to the body. It's not super extreme. It's just kind of like a little bit moderate, just to kind of like get the uh, more of that cone of defense with the with the, with the cloak. Right. But you look like you were doing it pretty good. Cool. Uh, Guess these would be less effective with the shorter half cloak. Um, so a little bit, yeah. So part of what makes the, these cloaks really effective is that it covers a lot of that low line. Uh, it just covers basically anything below my arm pretty well to the point where like the only thing that's gonna be really open is my lower leg, which is not a viable target uh, for the most part. Um, so if I don't have as much length, I'm not gonna get as much coverage. It's still better than than nothing, especially especially if you're in this forward lean, it's taken a lot of your main squishy bits away from your opponent. Uh, so I think there's still some use for it. You just might not be maximizing the cloak bit. Cool. All right. So now we're going to look at some of the clothes guards that we can do with these guards. So people have taken my offhand and dagger class. These will all be super recognizable. It's the exact same guards just with the cloak so if i am if i'm lunging at my opponent in prima i'm taking my offhand and just putting it basically under where my elbow is so now i'm in my lunge and what this does is it closes off the high outside and the low outside line and it covers a lot of the just in front of my body so if my opponent tries to disengage around this they're going to get stuck into my cloak which is super nice I go back into Gaudiamista and I lunge into Secunda. My arm is in the, my, my cloak is in the same place. Again, it's back by my elbow. Protect that low line. My sword is at shoulder height, palm down. If I am in, if I saw it off in Turtza here, 
I said turret and I lunge in turret. Point is still going to be about shoulder height. I'm uh, sorry, kill about shoulder height, point low, and then my offhand just comes across my body, protect my head. And again, I still get some low line coverage again with the cloak, which is kind of nice. And with the uh, with this turret stuff, you want to really think about tucking your elbow into your body because if you let your elbow flare, it's much harder to get the higher coverage over the sword. And then in quarter, so we'll just start off with the turret from here. I'm going to extend with the sword with my palm down. I'm just kind of close off, basically raise my uh, bend my elbow up to cover that uh, high inside line. Extend. So usually with the uh, the close quarter, uh, with offhand or with single or with dagger, it's kind of like this. But with the cloak, I'm really just making a uh, bend in my elbow 90 degrees while I extend it. So that's what it looked like if you had X-ray vision. So I'm really kind of parrying with the back of my hand uh, with the cloak. So those are the different clothes guards that we would lunge in with the with the cloak. Uh, now we're just going to do a couple of uh, transition drills to kind of get used to moving with the sword and cloak. So we're going to start off in terza. So start off with our extended terza. So again, cloak in front of my body, sword joined at the, the cloak, hilt at my hip. I'm going to extend the sword into quarter, bend that elbow like I just showed for that 90 degrees, and then finish my work. So do this sideways here. Do this, this other angle as well. Try that a few times. I'll try to see how folks are doing. Nice. And when I'm lunging in this particular guard, I'm really trying to balance being profiled with uh, getting my cloak for like saying, because if I'm super profiled, like my cloak is way back here not doing much, but I don't want to be super squared either. Cause I, at least for me personally, I find that very uncomfortable to lunge in. I feel like I little, lose a lot of strength. So I try to balance the two. And I think it's going to vary from offensive to offensive in terms of what feels comfortable for you. So I'm kind of doing it here. I'm kind of like in this little bit three quarter stance, not super profile, not completely squared, but kind of in between. So I get as much reach as I can with my cloak, uh, but I'm not uncomfortable while doing it. Uh, uh, another tr tr transition drill we're going to work on, it's going from Gaudi Mista to Secunda. Again, Gaudi Mista is basically Terza, oh, basically on guard stance, uh, with cloak, I'm having my cloak hand back by, my, by the hilt or back by the elbow. I don't want to go any further past there because I'm losing a lot of the advantage of the cloak. So how my arm is tired hanging back here for a second, well, out of measure is fine. Uh, but once I'm engaged with the weapon, I want to make sure my cloak is ready, to, ready for action. So from Gaudi and Mista, I'm going to go into our close the corner. So I'm going to extend with the sword first, turn my hand over, start to lean forward. And because my, el my hand is already by the hilt of my elbow, it, my arm is naturally going to go into the place where it needs to be, the cloak. And I can just lunge. I do it from this side so you can see the lean. I do it from the side as well. So again, the, the cloak is protecting my low outside line and it's really hiding a lot of my body as well. But I'll get right to your question in a second. 
Check and see how people are doing with this transition. Nice. I find closed Secunda much more natural and more comfortable to go into that, than that closed Quarta. Yep, so I really think about uh, when, I'm, when I'm lunging Secunda, I want my cloak basically underneath my elbow. You might need to go a little bit further past your arm. Uh, if you have a wide back, just going to your elbow might not actually cover the width of your body. And you might need to bring your hand a little bit further over. And I don't want to reach too much because that really squares me up. That's super uncomfortable. That's why when I lunge in Secunda, I'm really just aiming for my elbow or a little bit in front of my elbow uh, for the cloak. And then I'm bringing it further to my outside line because I have wider back. So if I don't do that, I get clipped on there all the time. <laughs> This is something to kind of keep in mind if you do a lot of pull-ups. You might need to go further than you think. Uh, Bella, can you explain what, you're, what you mean by your question, if you don't mind? Sure, sorry, I just, I'm finding the placement for corda, the corda lunge a little awkward and I'm trying to figure out how to like um, square that circle because I'm used to sort of turning profile like, like this, right? Yeah. And dropping the shoulder, but obviously you're not doing that if you look yeah. like because that defeats the point of the cloak. So figuring out like how to how to adjust that so that it's covering the correct point. Like, are you are you completely avoiding dropping the shoulder because you're like, or are you still pulling it back some? But like, do you know what I mean? Like, just trying to figure out where that spot is. Yeah, yeah. So I don't. I'm, when I'm I'm not doing that complete. You could do this complete profile lunge, but like it defeats the purpose. The defense. Yeah, it defeats the purpose of the cloak. So yeah. like, yeah. So when I'm doing it, I'm basically, I'm just trying to get the right angle so you can actually see it pretty good. So I'm here, I'm extending a little bit. Like I'm not, this is me super square. Mm -hmm. This is me super profile. I'm like splitting the difference. Okay. I think I'm a little bit more profile than not, but that also, I think that might depend on the length of your arms and stuff mm -hmm. too. Like if you can be more profile and still get your off, because I'm still trying to get my offhand to be almost in line with my hilts. Yeah. Um, but like if, I, if it's not, but if I have shorter arms, I'm further back behind there. I'm still going to get a lot of the coverage because uh, even though there is this gap between the weapons, my opponent's not going to be able to take advantage of that because of what plane it's on. So I'm aiming for this, but if I'm a little bit back here because that's what my body can do, I think that's fine. Okay, thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. No, that was a good question. All right, and the last transition we're going to do is from our quarter into terza. So again, a quarter, arm is extended, sword is pointed down. You can either do it with a sword pointed down version or basically the turrets up with your hand in quarter. Either one I think is perfectly fine to do. From here, I'm going to now extend into turrets So my arm is going about shoulder height. Point is gonna be aiming low, kind of aiming for my opponent's uh, upper thigh or uh, flank. And now my offhand is gonna cross my body to protect my, my head. So if I do that again, quarter, extend. That's trying to do that in like nice one fluid motion. I always want my sword to go first, especially if my sword is withdrawn. I need that tip to go sword to lead first and not my offhand or body, because uh, I'm going to eat it, eat some steel otherwise. So if I'm back here, sword goes, and then everything else kind of falls. I'll do different angles for you. So again, the key with that, this closed turret is really uh, tucking that elbow in because if the elbow is flared up while you're trying to do it, you're not gonna, it's going to be very uncomfortable. Um, you're not going to be able to get as much height on your hand above the sword, but tucking that elbow into your chest um, makes this a little bit easier. Also, it's also going to vary depending on your chest size. Um, you might need to figure out different ways of navig navigating around yourself a little bit more. Check to see how folks are doing here. Nice. And you can also turn your hand from turrets into secunda. That's probably fine too. Nice. Awesome. Any questions on those three basic transitions? 
Because you can do this with like any two guards. You can just like basically like flash cards. But like I want to start off in Secunda into a Corta and just kind of really practice that. So you kind of get used to moving from one guard to the other with a lunge. Uh, with the cloak, so you can kind of figure out how to navigate around it. Uh, for the most part, the cloak's not going to get too much in your way because with the Italian, we don't do a lot of like uh, what you see a lot in the SA, where it's a lot of like big, squishy, fancy flourishes and stuff, where that's you're more likely to have to navigate your sword around that. Uh, this cloak is basically just a soft buckler. So it's going to, if you've in, done any kind of buckler, it's going to be similar to that with you know, obviously some differences and stuff, but it's less likely to really get in your way. Uh, because we're not moving it all over the place. All right, so now we're going to look at some basic plays, uh, some super, super uh, simple offensive plays. If we had partners, these are, we could do these with partners, but we want to kind of just do a little bit of fight visualization. Um, so if you have, but if you have, that, that is its own skill. So if you find yourself having trouble imagining what your opponent's doing, um, just follow with what I'm doing for body mechanics wise, and you can just kind of use that as like almost like a kata. Uh, I catch it, like just kind of like uh, working on just the mechanics of going back and forth and stuff. So you're really working on good body mechanics. Uh, so the first one we're going to do, look at my notes. Okay, so on this one, we're going to be starting off in Gaudia Mista. So again, this is our kind of like our basic Italian lean back stance with our cloak, uh, either close to our hilt or our elbow, anywhere in between there is fine. The idea is we're going to be stepping in to find our opponent's blade on the inside line. Uh, and finding just means we're covering their swords. They can't hit us easily on that line. Um, they need to do a disengage to hit us. we do something super fancy. But we're basically putting them at a disadvantage by covering their sword on, by having our sword on top. Our opponent, in response, is going to perform a disengage because they're going to try to attack us on the outside line. If you look at my screen, I have this inside line nice and covered. But everything over here looks nice and wide open, so I'm kind of inviting my opponent to try to hit me there. So as I do that, disengage, they're trying to attack up and over my sword. But because my offhand is hidden behind the hilt here, I would be able to easily pick up their sword with the back of my offhand, lower my tip, and strike in this quarter. So it's a quarter with the point of low. Because they're trying to control my weapon, I need to do a little bit of disengage underneath to free it but not much. So I just love the mechanic drill. Do an advance with the finding, and then do the parry point low into that close court. Okay, a few different angles. This is very similar to some of the transition drills we just did. Nice. And I could do this with a full disengage. So I just basically was redoing right here on this one. It basically is a Mesa Cavaccione, so I have disengage to free the point low. But I could do a full disengage and now finish off with that with the sword higher and stuff. Either way is fine, depending on how much time you think you have for the disengage and stuff like that. If you want to, you want to strike them, you want to strike them in the high line, so by the upper chest ahead, you don't want to do that full disengage. But if you're happy, just hitting them in the flank, doing that low disengage. Um, now, this is also kind of a thing our opponent is just fighting single, or is, if they have an offhand weapon, they're not really doing any kind of close guard actions that we need to move around. But assuming that our opponent also has a cloak, um, we might need to try to move around their cloak or their dagger or buckler or whatever to hit them. So in this case, the same play, I would take a slight offline step to my inside line. So I have them found. They before, go back to my feet here. They before the cavicione, I do the parry and the half disengage, and I just do a cross line step. So basically I'm stepping toward basically like 10 or 11 o'clock but turning my foot so it's still pointing at my opponent. And that just lets me kind of shoot around their blade a little bit easier. So again, from here, fine. So I'll be kind of shooting around and hitting my opponent around the rib cage by going around. 
I could also do that with a passing step. So again, I find the perform the accordion in the pack. I parry. I can take a slight off line set with my back foot to around nine o'clock or so, and get that same effect of shooting, being able to shoot around that weapon by changing the body angles. Okay. Yeah, offline steps create. Anytime your 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 opponent has a offhand weapon that they're trying to uh, close off lower lines with and stuff, those offline steps help in terms of fixing the angle so you can shoot around it much easier. Instead of trying to blow through it, go around it. All right, next play we're going to look at. Uh, so that's really assume. So the last one assume that our opponent, when they're throwing a shot, they're really trying to gain our sword in the process to close us off. Uh, this other one, we're assuming our opponent is now just playing of uh, throwing a shot maybe to my uh, to my shoulder, or just they're not really worrying about my sword. They're just worried about doing a disengage and attack. So we see this a lot in the SEA. Um, people will just do disengage and attack without really trying to control our weapon. This is similar play, but another way we can defeat our opponent. So again, from Gadi and Mista, finding our opponent on that inside line, they perform their Cavaccioni attack to try to hit me on the outside line. But now I want to turn my hand into Secondo and close them off and strike with the left. Step in, Gadi and Mista, they do a disengage attack, close off, and strike. So in this case, I'm, their blade is up here, kind of where my arm is shaking right now. So I'm bringing my hilt up to pick up their weapon in there at that point. And then I lunge, and again, my cloak is just there as a backup to keep me nice and safe. So if I do it from this three quarter view this way. Let's see how folks are doing with that. Yeah, so for the play, for this one, terms like a righty versus lefty. Uh, so if I'm in, if I'm finding my opponent on this, on my inside line, that's going to be their outside line. Uh, so if they do the disengage, can pick up, I still, I still might do that offline stuff. Uh, it's going to hit them probably more toward their, like, their middle or their, uh, their rear flank. Um, just running through my head again. Think that will work based on my what I'm trying to do with fight visualization. Sometimes my lefty versus righty fight visualization is a little bit off kilter. Uh, it should work. We might need to like tweak a couple of things just based on like the angles and stuff. Uh, but the general principles of all these plays should work. Uh, we just might like how you step might need to vary based on uh, what your opponent's doing at that point. That's a good question. I'm sorry that I'm not better at the righty versus lefty translation. I'm trying. <laughs> Do you mind if I comment on that? Yeah, by all means, if you have some insight. I think most of these plays would work fine. Um, the only one that's going to require a lot of modification is the very first one you showed us, where if you come on guard, if you take me to my inside and I disengage to attack your sword shoulder, you're going to have to come much further across with the cloak to catch me. Than, than you would a righty. Yeah. So we, I think I have a play that might actually help with that. And actually, we can jump to that one. See, see if this one kind of helps answer that that question and stuff. Um, so this one is. Uh, I'm going to basically. So I can. This is a different setup, but like the idea is how our opponent gets to the attack. But this time we're going to be in a. Secunda, and it might open this up a little bit to really kind of entice my opponent to throw a shot down on that low line. If the one with here, I'm going to do is just basically the shot coming down to my lower flank, do that close parry in Secunda, and I'm going to turn my sword hand to Prima and just take a, a passing step. 
kind of shoot up and over. So it's an imbrocata, basically a, a thrust from prima from above. This is very hard to uh, uh, to parry. So you got to come here, you're binding that inside, you throw the shot, close it off, take a pass and step ball launching. So it's really taking full off that center line. Up. Yes, you, you would avoid my shot with that. Yep. So if we go, I kind of go back to that other play, right on the bottom of the inside. So now they're, the disengage is coming to my outside. Yeah, turning the hand to Prima and taking that offline step. I'm probably going to pick up the sword on the top of my, my forte and now just kind of walk it up. That offline step is going to really just give me extra strength and uh, being able to shoot around the blade and stuff or above their weapons. Yeah, when it comes to, so little thing on like righty versus lefty, everyone, most people are stronger on their inside line, uh, especially women because of the carrying angle of their elbow. Uh, women tend to be a lot more stronger uh, on the inside line, people in general, but just women are even, even better on that inside line. Uh, people are a little bit weaker on that outside line, uh, and women are even more weaker on the, out, that outside line because of the carrying angle. Uh, so if you think like the stats are kind of like, based on that elbow and stuff, stronger on the inside, a little bit in the weak on the outside. So if you're fighting versus, if you're a lefty fighting a righty or, or a righty fighting a lefty, you want to control your opponent's outside line because now they're going to try to, they're going to have to try to resist uh, on that outside line, which is very weak, where you're going to be much stronger. So always trying to use your inside line to control their outside line is uh, a good starting point uh, when fighting a lefty or if you're a lefty fighting a righty. Um, and if you do need to basically do a counterattack on your outside line, I find Creamer is probably going to be more useful because the opponent can be easily pushed out of the way. Uh, or they might be able to do a, like try to bank around a shot, but turn to Prima, that's going to give you a little bit extra leverage. So those are a couple of things to kind of play around with as a lefty or as a righty facing lefty. All right, uh, next play we're going to look at is an invitation in Terza. So again, my, I'm doing my close extended transfer, killed by my hip. So again, if I'm right here, I'm kind of closing off, uh, uh, wait, what's my, what's my um, nice to close off. So again, I might kind of open this up to kind of invite my opponent to throw a shot at my chest. Let's open up right here. And as that comes, I'm going to just basically lower my tip, bring my sore arm across, and strike. And I can do that with a lunge. I can do with the passes. So that's the lunge. Passing step version. So you got to kind of practice both footwork. And depending on how dedicated my opponent is to that, this attack, I might not need to really move much at all. I could probably just be in this one stance close them off, and they, if they're really lunging at me hard, they might run themselves onto my weapon. Otherwise, if they're kind of not committed as much, or I'm not as, I don't have the same range as my opponent, maybe I'm shorter, close off and lunge, or close off and take a pass at the step. Nice. And basically how you're hitting in Terza can kind of vary uh, in this particular play. So if I'm right here and my opponent's coming, I could basically just do that like very uh, basic close Terza where my point is low, tilt it at my shoulder height, hand high. I could also do it in a, a slightly different way in which um, opponent's attacking, bring this offhand, Still keeping the hilt a little bit low. So this, the first one was like this. I could also strike this kind of way. Um, this still like, because I have enough cloth there, I'm still kind of, my weapons are still joined. Uh, so it's still like close guard, maybe not be as super strong, but depending on uh, the timing and the angle you need to shoot uh, uh, to hit your opponent, 
this upward shot also gonna be very difficult to, to parry it. So those are just a couple of different ways. And this upward angle shot is probably gonna hit your opponent armpit, upper ribs. That first version is gonna probably hit more flank, hip, and upper thigh. Let's see. All right, so this is a fun one. So this is this is going to be another uh, step in which our opponent is trying to. Uh, this time maybe they're attacking just straight to our sword arm. So we're going to be starting off in in turrets there again. So again, if I'm using my turrets, I might open up to kind of invite this attack. Uh, if I if I know my opponent, when I'm always like this, they're just very cautious and I walk and they're not attacking. I want to try to get them to think I'm screwing up, so they might take the bait open up just a smidge. Now they can see my body, which is more likely to get them to throw a shot. So now the thing about throwing a shot at my shoulder or my sword arm. And from here, as I throw that shot, I'm going to bring my off hand across my body, but I'm going to pull my arm back. So now again, it's just like this position. I'm going to do this from a different angle so you can see how, how the sword is. And then from here, I can extend and do a lunge. So if I do it from this other angle, here in the terza, the throwing a shot through my shoulder, I'm going to bring my cloak across my body. So I basically have my, again, I'm doing a 90 degree bend on my, with my elbow to get some nice, uh, nice angle. And I'm bringing my sword arm down. If I try, if the throw from my, my shoulder here, and I extend, it's possible, it's possible that they might actually run into my bicep. They probably might hit my bicep or my shoulder, which I don't want. So I need to void my arm until my cloak gets control of their weapon. So from here, and I'm doing a little bit of a twist with my feet. So basically now my front foot is bent at 90 degrees and my back foot is straight, which lets me do a nice, basically, you opposite it's a lunge but now you're if you're riding your left leg is the one that's doing the lunge or from this particular stance um from here if i didn't do the twist i could just do my regular lunge or from here i could do a again a cast and stuff so it really depends on how you're moving your feet depending on what kind of footwork you do i really like the twist so from here, twist to get that coverage, because now I'm going to have a lot of range. Because when I'm in my regular stance, my backward is really determining how far my lunge is. But once I twist this way, now my front foot is technically my back foot uh, in terms of what my range is. Because when I do my lunge, I can cover that much distance instead. So you can gain a lot of measure in your opponent. Uh, so once you pick up their weapon and they realize they're screwed, they need to run super, super far away and fast. And you just have so much range in that position to be able to kind of to kind of run them down and stuff. This strikes me as a perfect thing for a lefty to do against a righty. This is yeah, I got to fix that one right now. Yeah, because the swords are on the same side. Yeah. So you, yes, this is a good response for the lefty. Yeah, I agree. Yep, and then also righty. That means it's also good for a righty versus lefty. Whatever they can do against you, you can do against them. They just might be better at it because they have more practice doing those moves. But it works the exact same way. <laughs> yeah, and this also is very, just very push, uh, just fun and flourish and cute. Just that nice twist in attack and stuff. But yeah, that's a great one for your mirror image. Uh, let's see what else I got in here. We have 10 minutes left. Okay, so we actually, so for the most part, when I'm teaching uh, Italian rapier, I always mostly have people with their sword foot forward. Um, with cloak, you can actually do that refuse posture a little bit safer. safer. So now, I, as a righty, instead of my right foot leading, I can do my left foot leading with the cloak extended 
and I, and I can kind of now I can hide my uh, my sword behind my cloak completely. So this is my usual stance. You can kind of still see a little where my sword is. This way, I can completely hide where my body is and where my weapon is, which can be a lot of fun. If I can get close enough to my opponent now, I can pick up with the cloak, extend, and strike. And because they can't see my weapon, unless they're really good about knowing what my range and measure is, this is almost like a surprise attack that I can kind of spring on. I just, from this angle, again, now I have my opposite leg forward. I'm extended completely forward again because I want that cone to the fence. My weapon is, I can, I can rest it on top of my hand. I can just rest it, uh, hide it behind the cloak. Sword always leads here, so sword goes first. I can get to that close quarter and basically do like a passing, passing lunge. Well, from here, I could just do a reverse posture lunge but in terms of maximizing my range. Uh, really kind of lead sword first and then drop into your regular lunge position is going to be very nice. So just practice just kind of like moving in that uh, from that guard into a lunge and you can play around with different guards too. So even from here and so go into my secunda. You can also go in from my turrets in here too. So practicing that refuse stance with the cloak and go into the different guards. Uh, a nice roll you can do in front of the mirror, in front of video camera to kind of like check what your form and stuff is. Um, so most likely we're not gonna be able to easily just approach our opponent in this stance, right? If I'm like, I mean, maybe there might be some fences that will let me kind of creep in on them like this, but most likely they're going to probably try throwing a shot at my hand, which is a little bit more in our rules, a little bit more exposed to get hit. Um, but we can, we can basically fall into this guard. So if I find my opponent on the inside line here and got a Unista, and they perform a Cavaccioni to find me on the outside line, maybe they come forward but not really throw an attack. Now I can take a step back with my sword foot, will extend with my cloak into that reverse posture. And now my hand is basically finding their sword. So this sword is over here that I'm now covering with my cloak. Because they're trying to gain me on the outside, find me on the outside line. I'm withdrawing the sword in my body so they can't do that. And extending my cloak arm. So now I have my hand pretty much even near on, on their weapon. And now from here I can come back with some kind of close guard, or if they do it disengage over my cloak. Really depends on where they're attacking and where we have them found. So this little mini drill, finding on the inside, dropping back into that refused uh, extended cloak posture, and then just go into one of the different lunges, can kind of rotate them through. See how folks are doing here. Nice. Yeah, I agree, Jordan, that your cloak, when so you sign off with the cloak. Uh, can kind of confuse your own sense of measure and stuff. So this is definitely, um, you definitely want to like practice what your measure is for these, the cloak, especially in that refuse posture. Because uh, if you're doing that kind of refuse posture into uh, what would be your normal lunge, so if you're a righty, you're still leading with your right foot when you finish your lunge, that's a lot of more measure. It's basically a passing lunge. So you just got to realize your measure is much further. Um, and there's other ways you can attack from there. Um, that's for another time, basically. 
I only have a few minutes left. I wanted to kind of, and I covered everything that I basically wanted to, um, but I wanted to kind of talk about a couple of things that we aren't allowed to do in the SCA that's really fun with cloak, uh, specifically casting the cloak of the row. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just what Zawani did, blind your opponent with it. I um, actually did a bunch of videos shooting, trying to blind my uh, Pell Rochefort with the, um, the GoPro. So I like, try to edit that video up and stuff because it's pretty awesome about how bad I was at tossing that thing. Um, but we can do, you can toss it from a couple of ways. One, I can just toss it just straight from my shoulder. I have it up here. I could basically, like right from the get-go, cast it, but just by throwing it. Uh, I'm gonna try to not aim for my laptop a little bit off to the side and stuff. I just pull it back and toss it. And the idea is I'm trying to get it over their head so they can't see. But even if I just blind them for a second, so I here toss it and it blinds them enough, I can lunge and hit them. I'm probably gonna to wanna to take a offline step uh, just cause they might flail and just throw their arm up. So I wanna make sure that I'm kind of moving offline uh, to strike them with it. Or I can throw it on their sword arm, basically trying to aim for their, their hilt. Uh, so if I have a really heavy wool cloak, I can get on that arm. It's going to lower it. It's going to cover their entire blade, and they're not going to be able to do much to hit me. And then I can strike them. Um, obviously, if I'm throwing my cloak, this is a little bit of a gamble, because now I'm giving up my defensive arms. Um, so if this was like a real life duel, you jump me in the street, it's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a risk just throwing it at my opponent. Um, but if I have a dagger on me, um, tossing the cloak to try to blind them and then drawing my dagger might be not a bad idea and stuff. Um, so yeah, throw in the cloak. I can also throw the cloak while it's already on my arm. So maybe I'm fighting, 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 fighting. Neither one of us is getting anything. I feel like I can get an advantage. Again, I'm doing the same idea. Pulling my arm back to kind of like cock it and then tossing it. And it flies pretty nicely, um, even while it's wrapped around right there. Depending on how heavy your cloak is, you might need to figure out exactly how much oomph you can do and how it's going to fly and stuff. But this lighter one flies pretty well. And my wool cassock flies pretty well as well, even if I have it wrapped around a couple of times, uh, which I was kind of amazed about. We can also throw the cloak with our, the help of our sword. Fabris talks about this one. So if I'm in my refuse stance here, well, I, can, I might want to like unwrap this just a little bit so it's just kind of like dangling. I can put the tip of my sword back on here and throw it and then basically follow with the blade. So yeah, yeah, back here, the sword, the, the, the rapier is doing the throwing for me and then I can just basically follow its path because uh, it's basically blocking my opponent for me, clearing the way, and I can strike my opponent that way. That's a fun one that we can't do. <laughs> uh, and they also like, Fabris talks about, so like I kind of like have the cloak a bit more unfurled and you can do things like trying to like, not really doing swishy swishy, but basically trying to uh, flick the cloak at their face to try to get them to flinch. Uh, Cause if you get this close to your opponent's face, it's very hard um, for them not to flinch. Like our natural reactions when something's coming to our eyes like that is to close them or recoil or, or something. Um, so that's a, another thing we can't really do in the SCA. Even though I'm technically not hitting my opponent, if they step into it, then I technically hit them with the cloak, which is against the rules. But it's a fun th thing from like a martial a and S uh, perspective of just knowing that, yep, I could totally just at the camera, flick it and then throw the shot. And it kind of also masks what your own doing because they're not going to be able to keep an eye on your sword and your cloak at the same time. And they're probably going to look at your cloak because that is the big flashy flowy thing that's aiming at their face first. And then when they can readjust their vision, your sword's basically in their face. So there's a couple of other fun things that we can't do, but it is fun to practice anyways, uh, like in a controlled environment. Or, you know, you know, backyard fencing when you're not on SEA time. <laughs> All right, so it's two o'clock. Uh, are there any questions? I say I got some in the chat. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, how do you keep your cloak hand uh, from being stabbed? Good, good question. Um, 
So I bring this like Coke on. So typically if I am, if this was like an actual duel, I'm not suit and that this was like heavy wool cloak. Let me grab my heavy wool cloak one for this. I'm not super worried about someone being able to thrust through it when I have it wrapped around a ton of times. This is wrapped around like three times. There was a lot of wool there. They would really need to like super gack me. Obviously SCA, that doesn't matter. Um, so sometimes these guards might be a little bit more dicey. Um, but if, so there's two things you could do. One, you just always fight back from your basic Italian stance with the cloak by the, the hilt of the elbow. Uh, so they just can't take advantage of the rule of stabbing your, your hand. Well, if you realize they're gonna try to go for your hand, so if, I, if I'm in this Trezza, oh, let me fix the camera. So you can see this better. If I'm in this Trezza, I know they're gonna go for my hand. I can start closing them off with the sword. So they're basically giving me the devil eye, so I can now pick them up with my rapier and just attack into it. What I don't wanna do is withdraw the arm back that's going to create a space between my weapons that they can now they could basically faint to the hand and shoot in between uh so that's something you can do to defeat a cloak is basically faint for the hand to see if they're going to pull it back and open up and then you can see how that exposes uh, but if i'm defending someone that's thrown at my cloak hand i'm probably going to try to basically pick it up with my rapier and close off or give them your arm and Finish. Yeah, you could just, I guess, eat the shot and hit them that way. But I'm, I try to approach it where I don't want to get touched at all. <laughs> I don't want to get that gangrene because no one cleans their swords. <laughs> that was a good question, though. Uh, any other questions on what we covered or cloak in general? Cool. Um, thanks for showing up. This was, I, like, I like cloak. I don't get to play around with it. Uh, enough, um, but is, is it, a, it is a fun form. It really isn't much different than any other weapons form other than it's just a soft buckler basically and stuff. Um, but you can really confuse your opponent with it. It's one of the reasons like leading up to when I won K and Q, I practice with a cloak a lot because I know if I go to the finals, no one else other than maybe Frazier and like two other people would be very happy to hear the word cloak get called out. Uh, so I figured I would make that a strong point and stuff. But uh, one thing I also didn't mention is that everything that you learn about single rapier and with dagger still carries over. So like what we went over today was very like cloak specific, but I can fight everything like I normally would with single rapier. I just have my cloak hanging around uh, as extra protection and stuff like that. Um, so everyone that's taking my other classes and stuff, you can just fight like that with the cloak hanging off your arm and you're basically like 80, 90% of the way there and then these were just some of the, like cloak specific stuff that you kind of went over. Uh, but if people like this, let me like shoot me a message. Let me know. I'm more than happy to make this like a whole month worth where we can really dive into the nitty gritty bits of, of cloak fight a little bit more. But that's it. I'm going to stop the recording, but I'll, I'll hang out for a little bit in case anyone wants to just hang out and talk for a little bit. <laughs>